Welcome back, Novello Nation, to another episode of the Aaron Novello Podcast. I have with me today the luminary, the legendary, the 60-plus million-dollar man in gross commissions over his career. He's been a friend of mine for a long time, a mentor of mine, a role-play partner of mine. He's made an incredible impact in my life, the pride and joy of Santa Clarita, Mr. Neil Weichel. Indeed. How are you, my man? Uh, it's great to see you. Usually it when we have these conversations, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no face to it. That's exactly right. I won't tell you to shave, I promise. <laughs> well, this is great. And I always do my best to uh, you know, have people on the platform that I think can add tremendous value. And you are definitely one of those humans. So for those who haven't had the good fortune of hearing about your experience, I thought it would be interesting to bring people back. Because you, when I think about you, I think about like this iron, like horse, right? You've been doing this for 28 plus years in a very disciplined, very consistent manner, mm -hmm. high level technician, like world-class listing agent. And it all started, I remember you told me a story where in college, you actually sold books door to door. Yeah. People think real estate's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious. Try that from 8 to 9.30 every day. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think what's so interesting about that, like, so if you could, like you said from 8.30, you know, till late in the 7 afternoon. 7.59, Aaron. If you didn't knock on your first door at 7.59, you were off schedule. And they put the fear of God into you that if you were off schedule, forget it. So I can tell you book people make great real estate people because uh, they are very, very in tune to the idea of not wasting time and that every demonstration needs to be made. Uh, knowing your numbers. I mean, you know, you're 18 years old and they're teaching you scripts and dialogues and how to knock on a door and stand a certain way. Yeah, I mean, it was formative for me, for sure. Uh, three summers, very, very difficult, very challenging job, but it made me, you know, a different person to be sure. Yeah, I imagine it did. And I guess I'm curious because that is not... I imagine the attrition rate for that is extremely high. It's and over 90%. It's over 90%. Wow. Yeah. So what was there a time like as you were doing that and whether the different weather or like raining or hot or you didn't feel like it, like, was there a time where just Neil was like, you know what, like this is, yeah, I can do this. And this is something that I can see myself doing kind of moving forward. Yeah, because, you know, when you're young, you have no idea what you're going to do with your life, right? I know some people that are in their 20s, including my son, who's still not entirely sure what they're going to do with their life. And that's OK. Uh, but at that time, um, you know, I didn't even know exactly what my major should be in college. And after my first summer, I was relatively successful. I thought, you know, I'm good with people and I enjoy people. I didn't like the rejection, but I, I, I figured out a way to, to tolerate it. And uh, I thought, you know, I, I, I think business is the direction that I should go in. So, you know, you never know when the smallest little decision in your life is going to literally change it. Uh, and for me, that was, you know, that was definitely one. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious because I imagine the rejection was massive. So you said initially, you know, you didn't like it, but you learned to deal with it. So like, how, how did you learn to deal with it? Um. There is a gigantic amount of positive mental attitude taught to you. And I mean, I could spend the entire podcast talking about this, and I certainly won't. But you're taught to wake up at the same time every day. You're taught to take a cold shower because that reinforces the commitment you made to getting alive, excited, and full of energy. You're taught to do the bookman song after you have breakfast with your, uh, with your roommates. You're taught to knock on your first door at 7.59. You're taught to never make a demonstration more than 20 minutes. You're taught to close four times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you do this, you know, for your summer, right? Because you're in school, you know, and then you leave and, and you go and you do this. So what do you learn from it? You learn that selling is universal. Selling is asking questions. Seller is looking somebody in the eye and asking them about themselves. In my case, I was selling an educational book. So I was always asking about kids. Right. And you would go door to door and you'd say, hi, I'm Neil with Southwestern. We're showing the study guide to all the folks that have kids that are school age. And it's a great book with math and history. And a lot of people use it. I was just wondering, do you have kids that are school age or does anybody on the block have kids that are school age? Now, if most people want to help you. So you always start with maybe you could help me out. 
right? Because people like to help you. I mean, I could do the whole script to this day. Right? And that's what I love. Like I just, we were just talking about it and like, boop, just comes right out. Like, like you did it like, you know, yesterday sort of thing. And I'm aware that it was a long, long time ago. So yeah. what I'm taking from you is you learned a few things. Like one is that selling is a universal thing and it's not bad or nasty or like, it's just a normal thing. You also learn that rejection is part of the sales process. Very much so. Very much so. And you learn the power, it sounds like, of having a regimented schedule. Yep. And the power of asking questions, very specific, purposeful questions uh, to find out, you know, kind of where people were at. And when I think about you, I think you're, you know, one of the masters in this game around asking questions. Again, I've learned a ton from you. So you did that for three summers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One very successful, one very unsuccessful, and one that was, I'd get myself a C plus, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was formative. I mean, it, 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 because, you know, and, and, and people are going to hear maybe, you know, wow, this guy sold all these houses and made all this money. Let, let, let's make no mistake. Everybody from Tom Brady tomorrow to everybody listening to me, certainly in my second summer where I thought I would just show up and people would invite me into their homes and sign on the dotted line. I mean, I was an idiot. Okay. Because I crashed and burned at a very high level that second summer. I quit. I came home and the guilt was so high that I called my student manager back there and I said, hey, I need to come back and finish the summer no matter how badly I do. And I did. It was, it was, oh boy. I mean, it was, uh, it was soul searching time, I'll tell you. But, but in hindsight, I wouldn't change any of it. At the time I was, you know, I wanted to go under a rock and hide. It was so painful. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I wouldn't be where I am today without that experience. I can tell that based on what you just described. Now you had told me that story before, but not in that detail and having heard it in that way, it's very clear to me that that experience shaped and molded a lot of your personal philosophy, a lot of, you know, kind of your approach to things. So that's, a, that, that's such a awesome, you know, kind of experience to participate in. Now I'm aware from there, it morphed into kind of corporate sales. So you made this yeah. decision like, okay, business is for me. And I'm yeah. aware that I'm pretty, I'm inclined, you know, to be kind of in sales. So talk about that transition into corporate sales. So my last year of college, instead of going and selling books, cause I had done that, I interned for a software company in Santa Monica and the guy who owned it was, I mean, this guy, he lived next door to Johnny Carson in Malibu. He was a self-made salesperson. Okay. He didn't come from wealth. He, he was a self and a very good one. And Howard Smith was, was really my first big mentor. And Howard watched me stuffing envelopes and answering phones and scheduling appointments, sales appointments for the salespeople and said, uh, you can work here. I'll give you a full-time job when you graduate. And uh, he didn't even wait till I graduated. He actually gave it to me. So he gave me the entire East coast. And I would go with him and he taught me and we made sales presentations to sell our software programs. And uh, then uh, I stayed in that for a while. Then he went and bought an oil company and took me there. So two completely different kinds of selling, one very white collar, one very blue collar, uh, both very, very uh, good experiences. Both teach you that the business world in selling is one that demands that you make a certain amount of calls certain amount of presentations and you better, you know, you better produce. So for me entering real estate, um, the concept of not working. In fact, when I entered real estate, I, I had three jobs. Uh, I had my oil company job. I had a side job I was doing for Howard. And then I would come and I would uh, knock on doors and, and make phone calls uh, whenever I got to the real estate office, two, three o'clock. And then on weekends, I would do open houses and meet people that way. So I, I transitioned from corporate sales because I, I didn't want to work for, for a company anymore and I wanted to make more money. Yeah, I remember you telling me that you had reached a, a kind of plateau income-wise where you were earning probably about the same amount as the guy who was like, you know, uh, uh, in charge of everything. The president like, of okay. the company, the president of the company. The only <laughs> thing I didn't have was stock options. And when I learned that that was the ceiling, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. Now you mentioned Howard being a mentor and I consider you one of my major mentors. So on those presentations, as you were going and watching him, like what were the things, those nuanced things that you picked up from him? 
you know, it's a long time ago. I haven't really thought about it, but I can tell you this. Um, Howard was very, very good at interjecting humor into his presentation. And sometimes you and I, our personality styles, we tend to be very focused on the end result and yeah. we need to let our hair down a little bit and just be human with people and make them laugh. Um, there's power in that. And he was the master at it. Everything he did was scripted. Uh, I can assure you he knew who Earl Nightingale was and, uh, you know, uh, all those early sales, uh, Zig Ziglar. Um, he took us to a Zig Ziglar uh, thing back in, I don't know, 1986, probably. So um, his, you know, he just, he was, he was just, you know, he was a professional salesperson. He'd been trained properly. He followed his scripts. He was very personable. He would look at you. He would use voice inflection in the proper way. Um, he knew how to answer objections. He always let the, you know, the, uh, the prospect give their objection. He would always agree. I understand where you're coming from. Um, if I understand you, it sounds like this is what your concern is. If we can, if we can answer that and make you comfortable with it, uh, would you feel comfortable talking to us further about the, you know, all the stuff you and I do to this day. I mean, it, again, it's universal whether it be making a presentation, answering objections, closing for a contract signature, it doesn't really matter, Aaron, you and I both know this, people want to feel comfortable doing business with people. Howard was great at making you feel comfortable with him. And I watched him, you know, every word. Yeah, that's awesome. In many ways, as I'm hearing this, you retell this kind of in a chronological order. It's like in, you were groomed, right? Uh, sure. To become the Neil Weichel, right? Uh, uh, of the real estate game. So that's, that's awesome to, to hear that that was your experience and that there were formative learning experiences along the way. Now, now when you made that transition into real estate, right? I'm curious as to what, having had all of this experience in, in like sales, right? Not right. whether it be door to door where it's gotta be this way. You gotta knock at this time. You gotta, you know, stop at this time with no exceptions. And then in a corporate environment where it's like, okay, you got to make this amount of calls, right? Yeah, you got to produce. And then you get into this environment, which we both know is like, eh, like do whatever, whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Like what was, what were you, when you got in this, were you like, what are you guys doing? Like, what, what was your thought process when you, you entered the business? Yeah. I mean, if I was being honest, look, I always like to try to be a little self-deprecating, a little bit humble, a little bit, because I just don't think that, you know, for us to be of value to the people that we that we are, whether we're coaching or training or, or role playing with, you know, people have to feel like they can they can accomplish what you've accomplished. They have to feel like and believe me, um, there were plenty of days where I was not very effective or very uh, good at my presentation or whatever. But the bottom line is, is I worked every day. And that's the big challenge I see is a lack of consistency in our business. So when I entered the business, the big thing that I noticed is people just wasted gigantic amounts of time. I, I just didn't really understand it. In, 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 in what I had come from before, that really wasn't an option. It didn't mean that you didn't take a client to lunch and you know, maybe just BS for an hour, you know, as, as because these were, these were customers that you dealt with every month. It wasn't a one and done thing. Um, but you certainly didn't waste time you know, you certainly didn't, didn't, it just, that isn't what happens in the corporate world, because if you do that, you get fired. So it's a, it's a pretty simple amount of accountability. Um, you know, does it mean that you're always great? No. Does it mean there's days you don't feel like it? Yes. Does there, it mean there's days where you did a, a, a less than satisfactory job? Sure. Cause we're all human beings, right? That's just normal. But I just didn't understand that about real estate, and, and especially because I was at least initially working three jobs and after a short period of time, too, I didn't have any time to waste. So it made very easy. I was afraid of failure. Right. We always talk about what what's the motivating factor when we when we talk to a client, a seller, we find out what is their motivation. Right. My motivation when I entered real estate was to figure out if the business worked for me, if I can make it work and if it did. Uh, to make sure that I could leave the other job and all the cushiness of a guaranteed salary and benefits and a company car and all that stuff. Yeah. And I appreciate your authenticity because that's true for me too. That motivation was fear and fear is a, a very powerful thing. And if you channel it in a proper way, it can lead to you know great results. So, yeah. so you had this work ethic. It was, you know, 
kind of, you know, molded uh, from your corporate experience. And it was like, you know, you just got to work and I got to do something every day, regardless of if I'm, you know, presenting uh, exactly the way I should be, but I'm going to put in the time, the energy and effort. And when did you realize where you're like, okay, I can do this. And then you thought that's all it took, huh? Well, so I I couldn't do both anymore. I was too busy. So here's what happens. And, and, and we'll talk about this because I've been thinking about it since you asked me to be on this. What's going to happen in most real estate agents' careers that, that, that are successful is they're going to go through different phases. And the phase that you want to get to, and, and, and I, can't, I can't say this clearly enough, is the phase where people are calling you more than you're calling them. And they're calling you because they perceive that you're very good at what you do and they should at the very least interview you for the job of selling their home, okay? Or the job of buying a home. In my case, it's, it's selling a home, right? And when I started out, you know, nobody knew who I was. I didn't grow up here. I mean, I literally, everybody I met was brand new to me. And what happened after a pretty short period of time, though, by working like every day, being in the neighborhoods, doing open houses on weekends, meeting people, shaking their hand, asking them where they live, asking what was next for them and their family, just being a human being and being friendly, um, is all of a sudden people started to call me after like seven or eight months. Hey, I saw you, I saw you sold the home over on Kenton Lane. Um, we're thinking about selling. Great. Right into prequel. So... If that was happening after six or seven months, I knew I knew that if I just kept you know doing what I was doing, I was going to be successful. So right. it was it was it was it didn't take long. It didn't take long, and you recognized that you made that switch, and then when you made that switch, and you no longer had the other uh, you know job, and that took a leap of faith. I mean, it really did. It was an, uh, a leap uh, that you believed kind of in yourself, like, Hey, I can do this. And, and I will never will forget okay. it. I know, I know what music I was listening to. I know exactly where I was on the airplane tarmac, realizing I had to quit on my way back to Los Angeles. Cause I was at a sales meeting in Chicago where the company was. Uh, and I was scared, but I was excited, scared. I was more scared to tell the people I worked with than to tell my boss or anything like that. But it was, see, fear is, is, if you understand that fear is a powerful motivator in a good way, if you understand how to channel it without letting it paralyze you, it can drive you to whatever it is you want to do. Many, many people do amazing things out of, out of fear of failure or, or, or just general fear. I agree. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing, necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent. If you can learn to channel that in a way. And oftentimes, like, it sounds like you had this like awareness. It just came up for you. Like, Hey, this makes sense. But yeah. then, you know, that little voice in your head, like, Oh, really? Like maybe Aaron, let me tell you what the awareness was. Are you ready? Yeah. In seven months, I made more money selling real estate than I did in my corporate job. <laughs> I was pretty aware. <laughs> You're pretty aware. And I love that. And me and you share that in that we're both motivated in that way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But once you became like, Hey, Yes, this makes total sense to me. You pulled that trigger. You... It, was so, it was so exciting. I mean, looking back now, because it is such a long time ago, um, the idea of having your own financial freedom in your hand, it, I, I can't emphasize this enough, is the beauty of real estate and, and, and not that many other jobs, really, where it doesn't matter what your formal training, it doesn't matter what your formal education is. If you're willing to study, if you're willing to get some mentors, if you're willing to listen to the right stuff, okay, if you're willing to get coached, right? By you or, or, or somebody qualified. And you're willing to simply apply that and go to work. You can make as much money as you want. Not one person can tell you, hey, man, we make $75,000 a year in this job. Well, no, you don't. I made $3.8 million last year. I mean, you could, and this year I could make 4.8 if I chose to or whatever. It's my decision. Very few jobs is it your decision how much money you make. Think about that. That's freedom, man. It's very true. A hundred percent. All right. So, and I love that. And hopefully you guys hear that and you could see if you're watching this Neil light up when he talks about it, because he knows from direct experience in his life that this vehicle, I think the problem is Neil, most people can't find a vehicle and, but this particular vehicle that if you will take time, energy, effort, resources, when I first met Neil, I had to push and elbow my way into proximity to him. I asked him to role play with me. And at the time I was doing 50 transactions a year and Neil was doing 200, right? So I got proximity to somebody 
who could pour into me and help me. And if you do that, you know, this could be a vehicle that, that really changes the trajectory, not only of your life from a financial perspective, but also your families and, and so on and so forth. So talk to me about, Neil, you made that transition and I know you had a lot of success. So I remember one time you gave a talk, which really struck me where you walked through the stages that somebody can expect, right? Uh, in their real estate career. So can you take a moment to do that for those that are listening? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I think there really are stages. So the first stage is when you start in the business and that stage can be as little as a year or two, or it can be perhaps even a little longer, but that is where you are figuring out where you fit, right? How are you gonna do this business? Are you gonna work solely with sellers? Are you gonna work with sellers and buyers? In my case, it was certainly both. In fact, my first few years, it was pretty equal. Um, and then once you get to the point where you know your inventory, you've studied your marketplace, you know who the players are, who the agents are, maybe you've, you've picked their brain, maybe you've taken them to lunch or you've talked to them, maybe you've, you've learned what sells and what doesn't. I mean, just learning which end is up in this business takes three years, understanding contracts and all the stuff to feel like you're sitting in front of somebody and you know your stuff as well as anybody. Now, you don't know your stuff as well as anybody. OK, you don't at three or four years, but you think you do and you at least can 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 do the job. That is all about laying the foundation for your business, your schedule, how you're going to work. Now, the next probably phase is where you're going to incorporate people to assist you. And I'm not talking about your lenders and your escrow people and that you've already established that when you started. I'm talking about hiring people to help you. I'm talking about a buyer agent, an assistant, a marketing person, right? Who are the people that you need to get you where you want to go? Who's your coach, right? Who's coaching you? Who's looking at your numbers every week? Who's script, uh, script and role playing with you, right? You need to up all that. You need to take all of that to another level. I would suggest that the first three, four years, you're just figuring out, you know, how you want to do this business and how you want to work. For me, I had no problem working nights, right? I took a lot of night appointments. Well, it wasn't very long before I didn't want to do that anymore wasn't very long before I gave up open houses. I think year four, I said, no more, right? I, I, I haven't worked Sunday since. I mean, not formally. If I work on a Sunday, it's because I want to, not because it's in my schedule. Then I think you go through a phase, which is really where it gets interesting. And that's where you become known, right? That's like year four to 10. You're growing, you're, you're working probably harder than ever, but also smarter. Your first three, four years, you're wasting time because you're just happy to have a listing appointment. You're happy if it, take, if it takes 90 minutes and you get a contract, you don't care. Years four through 10, you don't have 90 minutes to do a listing presentation. You have 45, right, to get in and out of there, right? So that next phase is where you really figure out how to make this profitable. I mean, those years, I think I've told you this before, I was so upset bumping up against 100 transactions and never hitting it in that, that second phase, years five, six, and seven. And finally, in year eight, I hit 110. And I literally have not sold less than that since, right? Um, but that was a tough market. And, 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 and for whatever reason, it was like the four-minute mile, you know? And then Roger Bannister blows through it and everybody else does too. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't quite get over it. And then once I did, it was, it was no big deal. So that, that, that phase right there, that's where you know you're in this for the long term. There's a lot of people that don't make it in this business, Aaron, much past eight or nine years. They burn out. They don't like it. They can't make enough money. They spend too much, whatever it is. That's where you learn this business and you learn how to be profitable. And it's also where people start to call you. So now you don't just have me calling people, right? Me doing an open house or me doing something where I'm hoping I bump into people. Now it's people are calling you because you're, you're, you're a household name, right? If you've done this job properly in year six, seven, eight, you're really starting to become a household name in your marketplace. Then after that, I mean, years 10 to 20, that's where you, that's where you bank it. I mean, that's where I could have retired at year 20 very easily. I think I made somewhere in the area of $35 million during that, that period of time. Yeah. And um, that is where you upgrade everything. You know, we were taught to upgrade everything. That's where you upgrade your clothing, your car, your schedule, your vacations, your staff, your marketing pieces, what you spend on marketing. I mean, everything is where you really, you become, you know, number one. 
right? That's if your goal is to be the dominant player in your marketplace, and mine was, um, you've got to realize you've got to be better than everybody else. And you've got to really study too, I think, when I don't get a listing, why? This is a new objection. How do I answer it? You got to work harder on your role plays. You got to get better, right? You got to get more efficient. Um, and for me and you, I mean, I think that's how long have we role played now? 10 years? Yeah, probably almost 11, probably something like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so near the end of that is where you and I started role playing. And I think you would probably say that you used to say, oh my God, you're spitting nails. I mean, it, everything is, is, you don't have to think about everything. Um, I, I had a, a, a thought. I don't know why I've been thinking about Tom Brady this week, but I had a thought um, on the beach in Hawaii uh, a few years ago, and the marketplace was doing some silly things, and agents were doing some silly things, cutting commission. You know, there was some stuff happening that we hadn't seen at a very high level. Um, Redfin had entered, and and you know buyer's agents were afraid that if they didn't rebate, they wouldn't have clients, which of course is ridiculous. Um, and I remember standing on the beach, I remember thinking, you know, the beauty of Tom Brady, why he is so amazing at what he does is he never reacts to anything. He doesn't let other people's actions, he makes the decision. He sees the entire field. And this is where you really get good at about maybe, you know, 15 to 20 years in, right? For me, it was probably about 15 to 20 years in. I, I, I'd have to think about it. But I'm telling you, after we went through the crisis of, of, of 07, 08, in about 2012, I was perfectly equipped for the next nine years that I've sold real estate. And then it really got good. And I never let anything happening in the market impact me in a way that, like, I didn't, I didn't get emotional about anything, right? I, and I, I always thought about, that's, that's what Tom Brady is. He doesn't care that this guy isn't blocking well enough or there's a breakdown over there. Or this receiver isn't running as fast as I thought he would or whatever. He sees the entire field and he says, well, this is what I have to play on. I'm going to play on this field and I'm going to score a touchdown. And by the time you have business maturity in this business, that is really where it gets good. That's where you can look at you know, how do I invest my money and what are other people doing for um, ancillary income streams? Uh, what am I doing to create a, a, a exit strategy that still allows me to get paid by my business? I mean, all this stuff you're ready to really put in place, I think, by year 20. So we could talk about, you know, little steps or nuances, but basically that's it. it, it year 20 on, I could probably do 110, 115 transactions a year just by people calling me now, as yeah. opposed to me calling them. Which is the culmination of doing a wonderful job for an extended period of time. So I wrote down the following, right? So for the first three years, you're just learning, like just trying to figure out like, what do I say? How do I say it? How do I structure this? What are the processes and procedures for attracting clients and then converting them, getting contracts right. signed and learning the business? Then you enter into this adolescent stage, which in adolescence, you start to have staff members who start to help you with some of the administrative aspect of things, which makes you more efficient as far as a technician. So you can therefore do more deals. And then you get to a stage, you said between like four and 10, where you start to get known. And now no longer do you have to, it's all of the people that you find strangers, right? Now people are starting to reach out to you. And then between those 10 and 20 is where it really gets fun and interesting, right? Because now it's very profitable. Now you can begin to upgrade things. Now you can begin to be conscientious and purposeful as far as like investing capital, having additional streams of income and things of that nature. And I guess I'm wondering because you've been doing this for how long now? 29 years. 29 years, man, which again is such a testament. Like when you bring up Tom Brady, I, to me, you're Tom, you're Tom Brady real estate, man. Like consistently, I remember seeing you say one time, that you had done a hundred deals a year for 10 years. And then instantaneously, when I heard that, probably like the same way that you felt on the uh, plane where you were like, yes. When I heard that, I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. And I'm on your eight. This will be the ninth. But you inspired that, right? You inspired that to, to make that happen because you had said that. Well, and you'll never go backwards. You know that. Right? I do. And I have you in my life to remind me of that. Well, <laughs> but hold on. Do you know why you won't? Uh, I think I do, but tell me. Well, 
because here's the thing that that most top agents have at least and it doesn't matter what their personality style and it doesn't matter what their marketplace one of the things that i noticed is they have a competitive spirit and they would not they, see the beauty of tom brady is there's never been anybody with his competitive spirit i mean that guy has competitive spirit. that's why he's doing what he's doing at 43 that's why i'm doing what i'm doing still i still don't think there's anybody close to me in this business now i'm not going to say that you know publicly but Maybe I just did, um, <laughs> but but the truth is the truth is is I I play to win every single day, right? Every single day. I mean, an hour and a half ago, I was sitting in front of a seller, answering an objection and getting him to sign a contract for one point four million, and there was never any doubt it was going to happen, and there was never any doubt it was what he wanted and what I wanted, and that we were going to work together and form partnership. And that's the thing that a lot of times people forget, Aaron, is is. Just because you have a competitive spirit, just because you have goals, just because you're trying to do something, never forget, it's always about the client, always. And that's the thing that I see agents screw up all the time. They're, they're, they, they, they take the easy way out, or they're not willing to work a little harder, or they're not willing to do something that a client requests as long as it's reasonable. They're not willing to say, I'm sorry. They're not willing to say, how could we do better? You know, that's what business people do. But for some reason, a lot of real estate people don't. And then they wonder why they plateau and never get any better. It's because they're never trying to upgrade themselves. That's exactly right. So, and after all, so, so 29 years, right, of doing this. So now you're at this, this is a new stage because I'm aware that you, you we walk through these, you know, three other stages. So now at this stage, right, for Neil. Right. In your mind, right? How are you seeing the next evolution? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so this, this is the stage of, of real estate now where I transition out of the day-to-day, -day, okay? Um, I'm still very much in the day-to-day. -day. I just told you I took a listing an hour and a half ago. I took one yesterday afternoon. And that's not gonna change in the short term. But what is gonna change is the idea that I do all the lead follow-up, that I am immersed in a lot of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of the business. That's now going to be transitioned to my team. I have three, you know, three people under me. Um, it's time for them to make a lot of money, or at least more than they have been. And so they'll handle some of my past clients eventually. They'll handle, I mean, we, we're spending a lot on lead generation now, which I've never done before, as you know. And it's, you know, because we have a lot of listings, it's powerful. I mean, it's paying for itself by a strong factor. Um, and so now it's time to transition to that. And instead of being, I think you've used the word technician three times. And every time you use it, I cringe because you know, I'm the ultimate technician. I mean, I'll go out and I'll work 14 hours a day, you know, like nothing, but that's not who I should be anymore. Now I have to transition to manager entrepreneur 90% of the time, right? Not, not 10% of the time. And I'm wondering, is that even for you with all of your experience, with all of the kind of success accolades, all the income, right? That transition, because I'm aware that it's a different way of thinking. I'm aware that it's a different kind of approach. And I'm also aware, at least for me anyway, I'll speak for myself. I'm aware that, you know, a lot of my identity can be wrapped up into the guy that does the deals or the guy right. that does, you know, takes all the listings, right? So how is that internally for you making that shift from being, you know, this, amazing world-class listing machine to now like, okay, now I'm going to construct like a business that does a lot of the technical work. Yeah. And, and this is the single biggest, hardest part of this transition, right? Because my identity is wrapped up in being the man or whatever it is you want to call, right? I mean, I'm used to walking in, making a presentation and getting that wonderful validation of somebody paying me you know, 15, 20, $30,000 to represent them and sell their home three to four times a week, right? I mean, that's kind of what I do. So I, I thought about this and, and, and I think I wrote down, you know, I like to, I write a lot of notes. I write notes every day. And I wrote down, I have to be okay, A, making less personal income from my efforts, right? In other words, letting somebody else do it instead of me getting all the commission, give part of it to them and let them do it. And I have to be okay giving up control, right, over the leads or whatever it might be. And then I also have to be okay giving up this identity, which really is a foolish thing if you think about it. I mean, I can train my staff to be, let's just say, almost as good as me. And if they took 70% of the listings and that they go on instead of 85%, 
but I'm off doing these other things. I'll give you an example, because I made this, this comment and I've done this, I made this comment for 20 something years. I remember Tom Ferry interviewed me years ago and he said, um, what do you think it is that agents don't do very well that they should do better? Which was a really good question. I think it was like 2001 or something. I said, Tom, what blows my mind is that agents say they want to do all these things and then don't do the very obvious things they need to do to get what they say they want to get. And the example that I gave was nobody's willing to study their marketplace. Nobody's willing to go out and look at the new listings and talk to the agents about how many offers they have. They're not willing to preview property. They, in my marketplace, I've always been driven by new construction here. And I got relationships with every builder, every developer, every person from the top all the way down in town because they can help me, right? And my buyers want to buy new construction. And if I know something that maybe can help them with that process, they're going to use me to do it. It's just common sense. If you don't study a hot sheet every day, what expired, what sold, how much did it sell for, how many offers did it have? Agents never do that. Well, I shouldn't say never. The good ones do, but like 80% of them don't do it. So this last week, I don't think you saw it, but um, at your urging and a few others, including my coach, I started to do a little bit more in the social media world, specifically with my Facebook business page, right? So this last, yesterday, I posted my, my beginning of the year blog, and it's a, it's a video on a site of one of the most amazing new construction projects that I think our valley is going to see. It's unique. It's special. The builder developer is a local guy who's he's a real you know local kid, makes good story in the building world. His name is Lance Williams. And um, so I've got his division president, who I know because I helped him at one point. And he gives us a private tour and does a short interview with me so that I then send that and you, you should look at it um, out to all my, you know, my 4,500 past clients, right? Between yesterday afternoon at three o'clock when they started getting it to when I hopped on this with you, I've had no less than 50 people, okay? I didn't call them, right? They emailed me or reached out to me and said, Neil, we'd be interested in this. That's what I meant to do in this last phase. Big picture stuff, right? How do I help this, this group of people that have entrusted me and, and allowed me the privilege of being their agent for all these years? How do I help them with whatever's next? And whatever's next in my world, because I, I live in a, in a valley that's still growing, that means new construction, which is, since I'm a real estate agent, naturally a, a logical place. It might mean being involved in city issues. So five, six years ago, I joined the local uh, EDC. Now you got to pay $6,500 a year to be a member of the EDC. I realize a lot of agents wouldn't see the value of that. I see tremendous value of that. These are 50 of the biggest business owners in town. I meet with them every two months. I get access to information before the public does. Hello. So this is where I am now, right, is, is, being, being the overseer, hopefully, of something, um, and ultimately the decision maker, of course, it's my business, it is the Neil Weichel group, um, uh, and how we're going to serve, you know, this, uh, this Santa Clarita Valley for the next 10 years, whether I'm out, you know, on a listing appointment Saturday morning at 10 a.m. or not, that shouldn't be the issue. So I yeah. know that's a long answer, but it, it, it's really where I am now and where I think a lot of agents, I'm 58, I just turned 58, a lot of agents that have built businesses that are now in, let's just say, north of 50 years old, have to start thinking, well, what's next for me? How do I hold on to this business without doing the day-to-day? -day? It makes me sad to see agents that I know would prefer to not be working every day. They're working every day because they have to. They need the money. Yes. It's the saddest thing ever, honestly. Yeah. Well, and I remember you shared with me, and it was recently, you were like, Aaron, you know, most people don't have the discipline to not only do this kind of technical work at a high level, but then to peel off like 30% every year and save and invest it. I remember being on a call with you and they were talking about all these esoteric like investments and like trying to like, you know, how can we like, you know, squeeze out an extra percentage point? And you're like, guys, uh, I'm pretty sure I have the highest net worth of everybody on this call. And everybody's like, uh-huh. You're like, you know how I did it? And they were like, how? You're like, I saved 30% of everything I earned from the beginning. When I was making hundred grand, I saved 30. When I made a million, I saved 300. When I make three million, I save a, a million. And that's it. And then I don't care what you put it in, whether it's stocks or real estate or whatever, you just hold it for an extended period of time and you'll be just fine. So what I wrote down, and this is great because I hear from you, what you're sharing with me is a very clear vision. And I know without a vision, the people will perish. And the vision is like chairman of the board. Yeah, I like that. Sure, sure. Neil, Neil's the chairman of this thing called, you know, the Weichel Group. 
and you have super high level conversations with super connectors in your community, right? To provide opportunities for this database of people that, you know, know and trust you and for your team members. That's and it. then you're not so much involved in the technical nuts and bolts. You have pieces in the three levers, which is like attract, attracting clients, converting, and then delivering world-class service. That's the objective. And, and truthfully, I, uh, we do that. I mean, we do it now. You know, we've got over 600 five-star reviews and um, I've got another thousand letters written to me before online reviews were a thing, uh, you know, that I've saved over the years from happy people. And, you know, it's just a blessing, really. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, someone else is going to have the money or, or do something with it. I'll be long gone. But what you leave, hopefully, is a legacy to the people that you serve. Hopefully you did them right. Um, you know, hopefully you, you, you put them before your commission check or, or before uh, anything else. Uh, you did the right thing. You know, there's a lot of opportunity to have impact in people's lives in our, in our you know, world. Sometimes it's just, yeah, Neil, sell the house. I got to go to Tucson. Okay, fine. But sometimes it's a lot more than that. And sometimes they're really counting on you. And, and, and when you deliver, it's, it means a lot to them. Um, you know, I could go on and on on that one, but we are in the service business and, and we should never forget it. Yeah. And I think what's true, like when you said like legacy, like what I'm aware of is, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a recipient of that, right? So like you poured into me and made a quantifiable, measurable change in the trajectory of my experience, when, which therefore ends up spilling out into other people's lives, like my children and my family and people that are around me. So I'm super appreciative of you, man. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with me here today. If people yeah. have referrals, if they want to connect with you, where can they find the great Neil Weichel? So, um, you know, uh, we're not hard to find these days, of course. It's, uh, it's Neil at NeilWeichel.com, and it's N-E-A-L at N-E-A-L-W-E-I-C-H-E-L.com. You can Google or whatever you like, or send me an email. Um, I've had people reach out to me over the years, and I'm always happy to help. I mean, Whatever I'm the product of, whatever I know and whatever I share with people, I learn from somebody else, right? I mean, this is the beauty of our business. Everybody, I think, that I've ever met has been willing to share. And that's how you shorten your learning curves. That's how you stay motivated. That's how you, you know, adjust your business plan if you need to or, or, or you know, invest in something that you hadn't really thought of that turns out to be a good thing. So yeah, people want to reach out. That's great. I'm in North Los Angeles County. Um, you know, if I can help anybody, I, I'm happy to do so. I'll tell you this, I'm uber busy at all times. I get up very early and I work, you know, long hours and I will do that till the end of, of, of 2022 uh, because that's the plan I wrote. Um, but I respond to every email. I never don't respond. So if somebody, you know, if there's a specific something or whatever. Yeah. So listen, guys, he's wonderful. He can help you in many, many different ways. If you have any clients in his area, send them your way. And if you like this episode, uh, feel free to go ahead and subscribe, do a thumbs up. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. I appreciate it, Neil. Anytime, my friend. See you next Thursday. Yep. See you then.